Many diplomatic veterans from across the political spectrum have criticized President Trump's trip across the DMZ into North Korea this week for what they say is giving dictator Kim Jong-un another photo op without delivering any new policy results. But assistant to the president, Peter Navarro, claims North Koreans are now living in relative prosperity thanks to President Trump. Let's think about the world we live in. Uh, if President Trump were not in office, we would see nuclear bombs detonating underneath North Korean soil as they make bigger and bigger bombs tests. We would see missiles flying over South Korea and Japan uh, going further and further towards American shores. Uh, we're not seeing any of that. What we have now is a relative calm, peace and prosperity on the peninsula as we move towards denuclearization. According to Human Rights Watch, the North Korean government uses forced labor from ordinary citizens, including children, to control its people and sustain its economy, and a significant majority of North Koreans must perform unpaid labor at some point in their lives, and that's just the start of what's happening in North Korea. Joining us now, senior fellow at the Eurasia Group Foundation, Mark Hanna, and Stephen Wertheim. He's the co-founder of the Quincy Institute, a new foreign policy think tank funded by George Soros and the Charles Koch Institute. Who would have thought they'd get together? Mark and Stephen, co-authors of a new piece in The Guardian entitled, Here's One Way Democrats Can Defeat Trump, Be Radically Anti-War. Guys, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, good before morning. we hop into your op-ed, Mark, I want to just start with what we heard there. I think the argument from the Trump administration is relative peace means, for the moment anyway, there's not a direct threat that North Korea is going to lob a, a, a weapon into South Korea, and there's been a little space given, perhaps, to start talking. Right. Uh, the, it's, it's a true truism that you don't typically bomb uh, countries that you're engaged with uh, diplomatically. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I mean, that Peter Navarro clip just shows how deeply unhinged the Trump administration is from reality. I yeah. mean, the, the, the North Koreans living in peace and prosperity, that's nuts. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about one way Democrats can defeat Trump, be radically anti-war. It's the piece you co-authored in The Guardian. Um, we were talking before you came on the air, Stephen, that apparently it's a radical position to actually talk about the wars that have been going on now for almost 18 years. It is, and it shouldn't be. We need to really come to grips with uh, the violence that the United States, unfortunately, has been uh, uh, inflicting to no gain to ourselves, really. Uh, and it's dragging on without end. And that's why you see this slogan of ending endless wars that's catching fire. And I think uh, the Democratic candidates have an opportunity here to take it seriously and to take a principled stand for a more peaceful foreign policy as they uh, try to figure out a message uh, they can uh, take to the voters uh, and then take against Donald Trump in the general election. But they can't keep sending these mixed messages. I know Donald Trump's foreign policy is all over the place, uh, but it, it really requires a clear direction for foreign policy and not just being against Trump from every which way. And ironically, Mark, yeah. Donald Trump a few years ago ran on this. We're going to end these wars. We're going to bring everybody home, bring our boys home, all, all the rest of it. What specifically would you like to hear from some of these Democrats? Well, I'd like some of the Democrats to actually represent the will of the American people, because let's remember that in a democracy, uh, it's predicated upon uh, popular popular support. And so, you know, it's Donald Trump isn't the only one. Barack Obama ran on uh, bringing our troops home from Afghanistan. Even before 9-11, George W. Bush said, we're going to stop being the country of nation building. So all these presidents run on, and, and Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. All these all these presidents run on doing less in the world and focusing more at home. It's a popular message. Then they get to office and they get people like John Bolton, Mike Pompeo in their ear, and, and they disregard uh, largely the popular will. So, uh, you know, this, I think you're starting to see the 2020 Democrats come out in support of ending rapidly the war in Afghanistan, investing more in infrastructure, making uh, more modest investments in, in the Defense Department, uh, and, and winding down our military spending so that we can prioritize the, the major investments we need to do here at home. Walter, not only are we talking about not talking about unwinding these wars, there's talk of war with Iran coming from the White House. It's interesting that some of the people, including people on the populist right and the populist left, are saying that's nuts too. We don't need to open another front in the endless wars we're fighting in the Middle East. And uh, you were talking earlier, I don't know if you want to talk about it, about um, you know, some people on other networks <laughs> who uh, helped uh, you know, dissuade Trump. No, it's not a secret. It's an open fact printed on the front page of the New York Times that Tucker Carlson at Fox called the 
the president and effectively talked him out of war, explained to him at least why it would be so dangerous to go to war um, with Iran. That would be the most uh, con convulsive thing to happen if all of a sudden we got into a war with Iran while we were still cleaning up in Iraq and still trying to do Afghanistan and uh, with the mess in Eritrea. Yeah. It would really bollock yeah. I wanted to ask real quickly on the Quincy yeah. project, which you haven't talked about yet. <laughs> Explain that to me and start with whether or not it's named after John Quincy Adams. It is named after John Quincy Adams. I thought Adams. So. that was a great speech you gave. Is that what you named it for? Exactly. Uh, July 4th. Yeah. 1821. That's where we're heading know. in July 4th, and there's John Quincy Adams, who had been president, goes back to the House of Representatives and gives a July 4th speech. Exactly, and he says that the United States should not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, and talks about how destructive that would be, not just internationally, but also to our own civic life in the United States. We're defenders we'll of be, freedom in yeah. our own borders. Exactly. We'll but be the, we well, yeah. the well-wishers uh, of, of freedom and, and, and prosperity to everybody around the world, but champions only of our own, I think is the a paraphrase of that. I mean, you were talking, Willie, about Iran. It's, it's notable that a majority of the American people, and including a majority of Democrats, actually supported Donald Trump's uh, decision to pull back those fighter, those fighter pilots, right? Uh, where have the 2020 Democrats been on f making a forceful and blunt and bold claim that Donald Trump's policies have put us into this position in the first place where war with Iran looks li increasingly likely after two quagmires in the Middle East. Uh, that's not what the American people want. And the Democrats have been largely muted on, on that. Well, topic. you know, one of the problems with the Democrats is they didn't know how to respond when he pulls back. Right. I, when he pulled back, I said, hey, that's good. But yeah. most Democratic candidates think, oh, it's horrible. He, you know, yeah, went up right. to the brink of war. And then he backed out. He blinked. He wasn't courageous. It's that old liberal internationalist instinct that the Richard Holbrooks and others brought to the Democratic Party. I, I thought the Democrats just said, okay, he was right this time to pull back. Give, give him that, but also say, like, look, these sanctions that we're placing are, are uh, you know, do, not just doing destruction and, and, and you know, get, making the Iranian government flail about, but they're, they're imperiling American interests in that part of the world. And so, uh, yeah, the Americans have no, no, uh, no skin in that game. So just wanted to say it's it's an interesting marriage George Soros and the Koch brothers how did that happen well really this happened with uh, five of us uh, thinking we need a fundamental rethink of America's place in the world that is fit for the 21st century uh, it's a century where thank goodness we've overcome colonial empires we've the world has moved past the Cold War but too often the United States has not moved on too often we've acted like an empire uh, and we've inflated enemies like Iran, or a adversaries like Iran, into grand ideological enemies. And so uh, we were fortunate enough to get these uh, two very different people on board. But you know, I think what the excitement about this project suggests to me, just from the news that we're setting up, we're not, we haven't even opened yet, <laughs> uh, it suggests to me a real hunger in the American people for some different alternatives coming out of Washington, D.C. And Walter is very excited about the name, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still think like John day. Quincy Adams, one of the great underrated presidents of our uh, history. That's high praise. And on July 4th, yes. we should always remember the great statesmen of America, including John Quincy Adams it's in that worth, speech. It's worth rereading the speech, and it's worth thinking about how it fits the 21st century, too. We have, I think, unfortunately, a, a nativist movement in this country, and I don't think we have a nativist movement uh, in 2019 or in 2015, 16, without years of people from both political parties, unfortunately, telling the American people that uh, we are in peril from foreigners who want to kill us. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump. And we're going to send your kids to war, not our not kids. Not ours, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Guys, and we're going we're to saddle the next generation with the tax burden, too. Thank you for being here, and let's hope those candidates are listening. When you Thank tell them about thanks, Hope so. thanks forever so wars. Appreciate Stephen Wertheim, Mark Hanna, thanks both. We'll be reading the new piece in The Guardian. Coming up next, we are halfway through 2019. The homicide rates in some of America's biggest cities continue to rise. Our next guest has what he calls a bold new plan for peace in the streets. Morning Joe's back in a moment. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.